Thank you so much uh, for the nice introduction and organizing this workshop and, in, and the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I really appreciate it. So today uh, I'll talk about the generation of tilted spin current by the collinear uh, antiferromagnetic ruthenium dioxide. So this work was done when I was doing a postdoc at Cornell University, and uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, different people as listed here. And also uh, I uh, acknowledge uh, the funding agencies and the nanofabrication facilities at Cornell. So uh, outline of my uh, presentation is the following. Actually, I realized that 70% 70 per, 70 of my talk is already uh, discussed by, uh, by Livo and Vivek, uh, so there will be some uh, repetitions, but it's okay. So first I start with the background and motivation uh, for this research. Here I'll talk about mainly conventional versus unconventional uh, spin currents and spin torques. Then I'll talk about the experimental measurement techniques, followed by the recent pre predictions of uh, ruthenium dioxide band structure. And then I'll show experimental evidence that how this band structure can lead to uh, very exciting transport properties. So let's start uh, with the spin orbit torques. So one of the easiest and efficient way to generate spin current is by spin hall effect, where we apply longitudinal electric field or electric current that produces transverse spin current as shown here. Here we have spins that are, are perpendicular to the direction of both uh, applied current and the spin flow. Now if we have an adjacent magnet, it absorbs the spin current and it experiences uh, both field-like and damping-like torque. If the injected spin kind density is enough, then it can essentially switch the magnetization, which is essentially the right operation of magnetic memories. And now uh, the state of the magnetization can be uh, read um, by analyzing the uh, TMR of an MTJ fabricated on the heavy metal as reported here. Uh, there could be other in interesting things, such as instead of having uh, in-plane magnet, we can have out-of-plane magnet on the heavy metal. And this is interesting because it is uh, very useful for the high-density memory applications. But the question is here, the generated spins are in-plane, uh, whereas uh, this is out-of-plane, so they are orthogonal, so they cannot produce very efficient uh, field-free switching. But of course, we can do some tricks, for example, applying in-plane field, that can tilt the PMM magnet a bit, and on top of that, spin torques can be activated, and uh, it has been shown in these pioneer works. So in this case, the state of the magnetization can be read uh, by the anomalous Hall effect. Only a single magnet is enough for the reading. But this is very interesting, uh, but of course this is not ideal. So in, in the ideal case, we would uh, require a material that can generate in-plane current-driven out-of-plane spins flowing in the outer plane direction. Because then these spins can directly interact with the PMM magnet and it can create outer plane anti-damping torque. And hence it can cause a very efficient switching. Now the question is that in what sort of materials we expect uh, this sort of unconventional spin current. So first let's take this case. Uh, let's assume here uh, this material creates outer plane spins when we apply in plane current. And when we take the mirror reflection, uh, we have the polarity of the spin slipped because they're pseudovector, but we are not changing the uh, direction of the applied electric current. That means it will not be possible in the trivial polycrystalline materials. So it has to be a single crystal material, material with uh, the mirrored symmetry broken perpendicular to the direction of the applied current. So this has been uh, experimentally shown first time for the first time in tungsten ditelluride and also recently in some other uh, interesting uh, single crystal materials such as copper platinum. But this is not the only way that we can break the symmetry. For example, if you have magnetic ordering, then that can also break the symmetry and it can also create various uh, unconventional torques referred as magnetization dependent or magnetic spin hall effect. Okay, so let me uh, give you a couple of examples uh, where uh, this sort of things have implemented. So it is reported that in magnetic trilers where we have one magnet PMA, which is uh, essentially a detector, and this is another magnet which is the uh, inject, injector of the spin current. In this paper, they report that the in-plane current creates out-of-plane spins and directly create out-of-plane anti-damping torque. 
So in one of my uh, previous works, I've shown, I've also did similar experiments uh, in the in the in-plane GMR stack where, where we had uh, both the magnets uh, in-plane and one of them was fixed by the standard uh, uh, ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic coupling. In this case, we find that the in-plane current also creates out-of-plane effective magnetic field that can also be useful to manipulate the PMA magnet. However, uh, in this case, the source is a ferromagnet which uh, could be susceptible to the external magnetic field. So we'll need a robust source of spin current and at the same time magnetic ordering. Both these can uh, simultaneously uh, satisfy it when we have an antiferromagnet. So that I'll discuss in the later part of this talk. So now uh, let me quickly explain uh, what are the different uh, spin currents that we, get, uh, we can get from a material by applying in-plane current. The first one uh, I already discussed, that is uh, uh, the demonstration of uh, spin hall effect where the generated spins are perpendicular to the electric current and the spin flow. We can have a situation when the generated, current, uh, generated spins are parallel to the electric field and they flow out of the plane this can typically happen in uh, materials having Drosselau like interaction. And also, we can also have the outer plane spin generation flowing in the outer plane direction. Now, if we have uh, an adjacent magnet, then the magnet absorbs the spin current and uh, it experiences six different types of torques. So these torques are, are very important to manipulate the magnetization. And secondly, just reading the spin torque uh, response, we know what sort of spin current is generated from this material. So now we need to know how to distinguish uh, different types of tor uh, spin torques. So there are two standard ways. One is in plane second harmonic hall, and second one is uh, STFMR. Let me quickly uh, walk you through this. With the, in the in plane uh, second harmonic hall, we run a low frequency current in the ferromagnet and a source uh, bilayer. So we have various uh, current-induced torques, and because of that, magnet oscillates in the plane and out of the plane. It oscillates out of the plane due to in-plane torques, which will result in the oscillation uh, due to uh, anomalous Hall effect. Uh, and uh, when it oscillates in the plane due to out of plane torques, the resistivity changes due to planar Hall effect. Now we have oscillatory current and oscillatory uh, resistance, uh, which uh, together produce uh, second harmonic hall voltage, uh, which we uh, experimentally measure, and, it, uh, and this is uh, fit using uh, these uh, expressions. So we have six uh, different spin torques to fit with six different expressions. So from these uh, coefficients, we can identify and quantify uh, the torques. Now, one important point is that, uh, note that when we apply large magnitude of the in-plane field, which is rotating in the plane, the value of these coefficients go down. This is how we can separate out the second harmonic hall voltage uh, generated from the spin torques from the thermal artifacts. In contrast, for the STFMR, we run a microwave current uh, in the ferromagnet heavy metal bilayer as shown with this small rectangle. And we measure the DC voltage by sweeping external magnetic field at an angle phi with respect to the current flow direction. So here also we have uh, various kind induced torques that will uh, oscillate the magnetization. And uh, here we measure uh, the longitudinal resistance. So we'll have oscillatory uh, resistance due to AMR that is uh, mixed with the oscillatory current which will produce a large DC voltage uh, as shown here. Now because of the resonance, we can fit the experimentally obtained uh, DC voltage with the symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian. From the symmetric Lorentzian, Lorentzian, we know all about uh, uh, in-plane torques, and uh, from the anti-symmetric Lorentzian, we know all about out of plane torques. Now we can perform this experiment for different values of phi, and from this angular dependence of symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, we can again uh, know all different types of torques. So both methods are equally good, and uh, we have used uh, in, uh, these methods in our experiment. So now, uh, before uh, jumping into the experiments, uh, let me quickly uh, discuss the band structure of ruthenium dioxide. So 
Even before that, let's uh, take the simple case of a ferromagnet where, where we have non-zero magnetization, which leads to spin split bands as shown here, majority and minority bands. Now let's uh, take a simple case of a collinear, uh, classical collinear antiferromagnets with net magnetization zero, so we have equal uh, population of upspin and downspin electrons shown with green and uh, purple colored balls. Now after taking the space inversion and time reversal, we find this material is PT symmetric. And since it's a, it is PT symmetric from the Kramer's theorem, it guarantees that we'll have uh, spin degenerate bands uh, with respect to K. So this was the picture of uh, collinear classical antiferromagnet. Now let's take, a, take the case of ruthenium dioxide. So where we have uh, ruthenium uh, sublattice with upspin and downspin, but we have oxygen atoms also. Now, if we ignore these oxygen atoms, then it exactly looks like this case. But the moment we have oxygen atoms, it immediately breaks the PT symmetry. Rather, we have 90 degree rotational symmetry in the system. The moment we have PT symmetry broken, so we, it allows to have uh, spin split bands depending on the K as theory, theoretically predicted. Now we'll see that the spin split bands will have tremendous influence. What did I do? All right. In the transport uh, measurements. First of all, the prediction was uh, if, sorry, the prediction was if we run current along certain crystal axis of ruthenium dioxide, it can create spin polarized current, uh, unlike other regular collinear antiferromagnets as predicted here. Also, depending upon the direction of the current flow with respect to crystal axis, with the help of spin orbit coupling, it can also create anomalous Hall effect. This was the prediction and also their experimental evidence. The third possibility is that even in the absence of spin orbit coupling, it allows us to have transverse pure spin current. Again, it will strongly depend upon the direction of the current flow with respect to crystal axis. Now, this is fundamentally different from the spin hall effect, because from, for the spin hall effect, the requirement is spin orbit coupling. But here, the requirement is the spin split band. The other difference is that here, the generated spins are polarized along the direction of Niels vector, unlike the spin hall effect. So this was a theory prediction, and uh, this is our uh, experimental report. So let's take the case of ruthenium dioxide. Uh, this is 001 plane, this shaded green, and this is 101 plane, and Niels vector points nearly along 001 axis, so out of the plane of uh, this 001. Now the theory predicts that if we run current along 010 axis, it will create transverse spin current along 100 direction, with the spins being parallel along uh, the direction of the Niels vector, which is uh, out of the plane. Now you will ask me, okay, we also see similar things in spin hall effect run current along X, spin current flows along Y, with spins along Z, then how is it different? How do we experimentally distinguish it? But first, let me convince you, for the spin current, we have, sorry, yes, for, for the spin hall effect, we have generation of spin current in all the planes. But here, it is, again, strictly rest restricted to certain planes. Okay, still, that's good, but how do we experimentally know this? But we find that if this theory is correct, then it will have very weird uh, spin current in another, in another plane, which could be a distinct way to know this, as shown here. So you can appreciate that uh, we can get this 110 plane here and uh, 001 plane here by taking the coordinate rotation. So in the previous case, for this case, uh, so this is the flow of the current flow direction, this is the flow of spins, and this is the spin vector. And this is the uh, 101 uh, one plane. Now we just rotate it like this. So this is the spin flow direction, and this is the uh, 101 plane. So in this case, uh, we naturally see the generation of tilted spin current. So if the theory is correct, we must see the tilted spin current, which could be a good proof, I mean, good way to uh, measure this. So for this, uh, we patterned uh, devices uh, such that we can run current along different crystal axis of 101 uh, planes, as shown here. 
as I mentioned before, we did two different types of experiments, STFMR and second harmonic hall. Note that for the 101 plane, we have Niels vector canted. That means we have projection of the Niels vector out of the plane. Yeah. Sorry? FID device or MBE? So in, here we have projection of the Niels vector out of the plane, so it can generate out of the plane spin current. And also note that when uh, if you run current along an arbitrary crystal axis, say psi, then it has, uh, then we have uh, in the, the projection of in plane Niels vector along the direction of the current and perpendicular to it. So in this material, we have X, Y, and Z component of spin current but that will have a specific angular dependence if this the theory is correct. Now, the question is, how do we prove it? So for that, we have, uh, we have MB grown high quality ruthenium dioxide films with an adjacent magnet as permalloy. Previously, I convinced you that from the spin torque response, we'll know the type of spin current that is generated. So that is exactly what we are going to do here. We'll measure the spin torque response on permalloy from that we'll know what type of spin current is generated. Since there are X, Y, and Z component spins are generated, so we'll expect three different types of damping like torques as, as shown here. Uh, I'm not going to derive it here, but we can easily show that from this projection of the Niels vector and direction of the current with, with respect to crystal axis that they will have a specific angular dependence on the torques uh, as shown here. Y component spins will create damping like torques proportional to cos square psi. Z polarized spin will create damping like torque proportional to cos psi, and X component will have sine to psi. So this is what we want to experimentally see whether it happens or not. So uh, let me uh, give you a couple of examples of what happens when we run current along psi equal to zero direction and psi equal to nine, uh, 90. Just to remind you here, we are doing STFMR, symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, and we want to get the angular dependence of it. The first thing we note is that the, the difference in the angular dependence in the symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, it is already clearly visible. The difference is because of this, this term. For the symmetric uh, Lorentzian, it, uh, it, you can fit it with cos phi sine to phi, meaning it is regular spin hall. For the anti-symmetric, we have this term, plus we have this extra term. And this extra term, which is sine two phi, indicates that we have out of plane spins flowing in the out of plane direction when we run current in this axis. Now in contrast, when we do the experiment for psi equal to 90, we see pretty same angular dependence, meaning regular spin hall for this uh, and also trivial or state field. That means from this, we can clearly see that it really matters in which direction we're running current uh, with respect to the crystal uh, plane or crystal axis. So uh, we want to uh, cross-check it by doing other measurement, doing a second harmonic hall. Just to remind you, we have this hall bar pattern. Uh, we rotate in magnetic field, measure second harmonic hall voltage. This is a typical second harmonic hall voltage shown for these two cases. Again, the thing that we'll immediately see the difference in the angular dependence of this second harmonic hall voltage. So. If you fit, we'll see that when we run current for psi equal to 90 degree, again, we have standard damping like torque from the spin hall effect and regular Oersted field. In contrast, when we run current along psi equal to zero, we have extra term. Again, this extra term indicates uh, we have generation of out of plane spins flowing in the out of plane direction. So summary of this slide is that we did different ways to prove uh, spin current or spin torques and they are in good agreement suggesting that we have very strong uh, crystal axis dependence on conventional spin current. Now we repeat this experiment for all the all different angles as shown here, and this is a summary of the result. So we find that the Y component spins create damping like torque proportional to cos square psi. Z component spins create, co um, follow cos psi angular dependence, and X component follow sine to psi. This is very good agreement with the theoretical predictions and it clearly supports that we have uh, tilted spin current generated in ruthenium dioxide, and it has very specific angular dependence, in this, suggesting that it origins from the spin split bands. So uh, recently we find that our work is reproduced in other laboratory as shown here, and also 
other uh, groups have reported spin torque uh, measurements uh, on ruthenium dioxide. So uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? OK. So uh, we did a few more experiments. First of all, I, I'm always curious, OK, uh, whether we probe something, we pick up something from the crystal structure or not. So we measured iridium dioxide, same plane, same direction, but we find there is no extraordinary spin current, meaning the rutile crystal structure is not enough. We need the magnetic ordering. Secondly, we also measured other planes of ruthenium dioxide, such as 001 plane. In that plane also, we do not see any uh, extra, uh, extraordinary spin current or spin torques, neither it is theoretically expected, meaning we find very strong uh, crystal axis and crystal plane dependent uh, uh, generation of uh, extraordinary spin current. The third thing is that we inserted spacer and we find that when we have spacer between the source and the detector, the spin current goes, the effect of spin current goes down, but it still doesn't become zero, meaning the spin current generates from the bulk of the ruthenium dioxide. And also we did the measurement for, uh, as a function of ruthenium dioxide thickness and find it uh, saturates uh, if we have uh, ruthenium dioxide nearly 10 nanometer. These two again suggest that uh, the spin current is generated from the bulk uh, band structure of ruthenium dioxide. That's the last point is very important. We did temperature dependent studies of this extraordinary spin current. We find very strong uh, correlation with the temperature. It increases nearly about a uh, factor of 200%. This tr strongly suggests that it could be due to uh, it could be generated due to the, I mean, it could be due to the time uh, or the spin current, which is again a consequence of the spin split bands. However, the time event spin currents from a regular spin hall effect uh, will have very uh, weak temperature dependence. So, yes. Uh, so with this, I like to uh, conclude my talk by summarizing what I what we did. So we uh, measured spin orbit torques in single crystal ruthenium dioxide permalloy bilayers. We, we observed tilted spin current, which has a, which has a specific uh, angular dependence that is consistent with the theory predictions. Uh, and with this also, I'd like to point that uh, there, there is also possibility of time, even spin current, that could also lead to similar sort of angular dependence. But however, the theory predicts that the time even spin current should be order of magnitude uh, uh, smaller. So this is the takeaway message, and uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much.